Book 3, The Mansions of Idumea, Chapter 14. The enlisted men are teaching the brassy a thing or two. The Shin family stepped out of the mansion's coach and pools and stared at the long building before them. Or rather, they stared at the long line of people waiting to get into that building. Perrin let out a low whistle as the coach drove off to the livery stables nearby. They said Gazada was successful, but this? He gestured feebly, and his family nodded in astonishment. It wasn't the first thing Mari marveled at that evening. After two dreadful days of dinner preparation, Joriana surprised them with the suggestion that it was time for the family to be seen. And the best place to be seen was at Gazada's restaurant in Pools. Seen doing what? Perrin had asked, confused. He was initially pleased with the idea of visiting his former staff sergeant's place until he saw just how excited his mother was about it. Gazada's is the talk of the whole city and of pools and orchards and anywhere within 30 miles. Only the best and brightest can afford to go there. Well, that excludes us, Pato sounded disappointed. One look at us and they'll, oh no, Joriana said firmly, you'll get in. You'll dress up in that shirt I bought you today, young man. Jatesy and your mother in their new best dresses, Perrin in his uniform, all of you in our coach, you'll be seen. I'm rather surprised, Mari had said, that Gazada's sandwiches are so popular. I mean, yes, there's nothing in the world quite like them, but sandwiches. Gazada doesn't do sandwiches, Mari. Joriana hooted. He does cuisine. Rather like some of what your mother tries, but bigger. You'll see. It's amazing. And here. She slipped something into Perrin's hand. His eyes bulged. A full gold slip? It's a bit pricey, but well worth it. Dinner's on me. Go now. Enjoy. With shared licks of confusion, they went. An hour's drive later, they arrived on a busy road in pools and wondered if the same tubby man they knew in Edge years ago really was attached to such a place as this. This was nothing like the inn at Edge, where Hysimum and another girl whipped up meals and desserts for travelers or villagers in the mood for something different. First, the inn of Edge didn't have trees and flowers and vines all over the building as if a controlled explosion of nature had been aimed directly at it. Nor did the Inn at Edge have tables and chairs outside the building, where guests in silks and fine woolens and wraps of fur sat to wait for an opening inside. In fact, nothing in Edge had chairs and tables quite like these. Apparently, some blacksmiths decided horseshoes weren't interesting enough, and instead twisted iron into curious shapes that bordered on works of art that people then sat rudely upon or leaned against. Fires in large round pots were artfully placed around the area to warm those feeling the wind evening chill, and to illuminate the vegetation that adorned the simple yet grand stone and planked structure. Above the wide doorway was a painted board with the word Gazadas, written in more black twisted iron, and illuminated by black torches on either side. Standing before the door was a rather burly man, dressed in crisp white tunic and black trousers. He stood almost as if at attention, and stiffly opened the door as guests went in and out. He opened it now for an older man, also similarly dressed, who held a small board and announced in a sufficiently bored tone, Lansing, party of four, James, party of two. Six people immediately rose and strode eager, eagerly but elegantly to the open doors, where a third man led them away. Pato scowled. Eating with any of them wouldn't be a party, I'm sure. This is crazy, Perrin murmured, and headed for the still open door, his family behind him. Excuse me, he said to the older man. Exactly how long a wait for dinner? Several people in earshot sniggered at the shins, and someone said derisively, Locals. Another voice near the fire said, Careful, brass buttons. And Mari glanced over to see several people taking in her husband's jacket. Suddenly, he and his party were worthy to stand among them. 
The whisper of brass buttons filtered down none too subtly among the hungry helpfuls, while Perrin's ears went red. Oh, brother, Jatesy murmured in disgust. You said it, sister, Pato murmured back. Mari pursed her lips to keep from smiling, but Perrin was still waiting for an answer. The man at the door looked him up and down. Colonel, is it? You look vaguely familiar. You're not the younger Shin, are you? Perrin sighed loudly as another murmur of, could be the younger Shin, traveled along the fancy dressed waiting. Does it matter? Perrin asked. It does if you want to eat in an hour or in three, the man shrugged. An hour? Peta wailed softly. Mari elbowed him. Perrin glanced at the line of Idemia's elite and saw all of them watching him back. Look, he said quietly to the man at the door, I'm an old friend of Gazada's and we only wanted to say hi. Mr. Chef Gazada has many friends, the older man intoned, and he held out his hand. Perrin frowned at it. Something wrong with your hand? Oh, wait, now I remember. He fumbled around in his trousers pocket. Chef? Pato murmured to Jaitsi. That's his first name? I thought it was Zada. Seriously? Jaitsi whispered back. You think his parents named him Zada Gazada? Zada was the name we gave him when we were little. You've got to be the dumbest ow. Mari's boot heel came down on her daughter's toes as Perrin fished out a slip of silver and dropped it into the man's hand. Wait, you have to bribe people to ow! Pato's question was abruptly stopped, again by Mari's boot, which was getting quite the workout on her children's feet. The man at the door looked down at the silver on his palm. Not much of a friend of Mr. Chef's, I see. Perrin's mouth dropped open, and Mari was about to protest when a booming voice from behind the man surprised them all. My little ones are not so little. I heard you came to Idemia, but I can't believe you're here. Through the door burst an enormously round man, the color of rich brown soil, with flush dark red cheeks and a massive grin. His arms were held out wide as he plowed unceremoniously over his employees stationed at the door. It's the shins, Gazada bellowed, and he caught Perrin and Mari in a huge hug. And that just cannot be my little Jaitsey and Pato. Perrin and Mari would have laughed if Gazada hadn't been squeezing the breath out of them. But Jaitsey and Pato howled at the former soldier who always had a treat, or four or five, in his pocket for the commander's children. Zada, they cried as he finally released a winded and chuckling Perrin and Mari and braced both children next. Mari couldn't help but gaze down the line of waiting wealthy. Each fancy-dressed man and woman wore the look of stunned envy, and for the first time since she came to the city, she felt as if she belonged there. Oh my, Gazada chuckled as he finally let the children go. He eyed Jaitsi and glanced nervously at Perrin. I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't have done that, seeing as how you're such a, my goodness, such a young woman. He shook his head in amazement at Jaitsi. Mari cleared her throat and gave a look to her husband. Even his former staff sergeant could see what their daughter had become. So should Perrin. And Pato! Well, I guess you'll get there too, son. Gazada slapped his skinny back. But Colonel Shin! I heard about that promotion and Mrs. Shin, so glad you're here. His grin was dazzling. Come in, come in! To the astonishment of everyone else standing in line and the two employees at the door, Gazada ushered in the Shin family ahead of everyone else, except for Pato, who turned to the startled men. My father told you we were friends of Gazada. Next time, you should probably listen. He's not wearing that sword just for show, you know. Pato! Perrin barked, but the damage was done. The men were pale, and Pato snickered in triumph as he followed his family and Gazada into the restaurant. Gazada, I can't believe what you've created here, Mari gasped in astonishment at what now redefined fancy in her mind. Tables were covered in linen cloths, and the plates were made of a white fired clay she later learned was called porcelain. 
Even the forks, knives, and spoons were hammered with elaborate designs on the handles. Silk cloths with intricately woven designs covered the walls, and set in tall arrangements on each table were more flowers and vines, which, Maury noticed later, were also made of silk. Candles in fantastically detailed holders illuminated the tables, each one occupied by more wearers of fine wools and dead furs, chatting happily and eating daintily. Somewhere, a few people were playing flutes and guitars as accompaniment, which Mari thought the oddest thing to listen to while one was trying to eat and talk. Weaving in and out of the tables were men in pristine white tunics and black trousers, carrying trays of food so carefully laid out that each was a miniature work of art that lasted only one moment before it was consumed. Truly astounding, Staff Sergeant, Perrin said as he eyed the water fountain bubbling in the middle of the restaurant. I'm completely overwhelmed. Gazada smiled and cleared his throat. But that's not what you really think, Colonel. Gazada cocked his head toward a door across the crowded room. Follow me. Through the tables they wove, people frequently catching Gazada's arm to compliment Chef on one thing or another, and cheerfully he took their thanks but picked up his pace. He opened a finely carved door and the shins filed into a private room with a long table, vases of fresh blossoms and forks that looked to be made of gold. Gazada closed the door behind them. Private party of senior officers will be here soon, he gestured lazily at the table. But we have a few minutes until they come in. So, will the High General recover? He asked Perrin. Seems he will. Even if he couldn't finish that fantastic sandwich you sent over earlier today, that's what got all of us hungry. Gazada grinned. I was hoping he'd enjoy that. So, you still know how to make them? Pato asked, because what I saw out there, Gazada on those plates was barely enough to feed a rabbit. Pato! Mari snapped at his rudeness. No, he's right, Gazada nodded. That food's ridiculous. Tiny portions and silly presentations, that's what the elite of Itamia like, Pato, as ridiculous as it is. But, and he leaned in closer, feeding them allows me to feed others and properly. What do you mean? Pato asked. Tell me what you want, and I'll get it. He turned to Perrin and Murray. Do you want to eat what Itameans call high culture? Or do you want something that will put some muscle on that skinny boy? Muscle, Perrin declared, please. Gazada put a finger to his lips and said, Then follow me to the best kept secret in pools in Itameia. He opened the door, and the shins followed him out of the room and toward the kitchens. And that was another shock, to pass so many stoves and ovens and boiling pots and open flames and work tables and men and women frequently shouting chef and rushing to set up plates and almost crashing into the four strangers that nearly tripped in their hurry to follow chef to another door, which ended in a small storage room. Very secretive, Pato said. I can see why you don't want anyone knowing where you store the potatoes. Gazada chuckled and said, No, my still little one. He grinned as Pato scowled at the earned insult. This is the secret. He cracked open another door that, at the moment before, looked like a planked wall. Take a peek, Colonel, and tell me if this is more to your liking. Perrin peered in. Now, that's more like it. Mari peeked under his arm to see a much different view. Instead of fancy cloth and wrought iron chairs, there were long wooden tables with log benches. Instead of fabric draping the walls, there were high clear windows that let in the fading sunlight. Instead of a water fountain in the middle of the room, there was a large fire pit with benches all around where people could chat and warm themselves. Mari chuckled. Counters on two sides of the room had tall stools crowded along them and a board on the wall listed the simple menu. Meat of the day, dessert of the day, gazada sandwich, small or large. The prices were also quite reasonable. A small sandwich was only a quarter slip of silver, and the large was half a slip. 
And just like the restaurant in the front, this place was packed with customers. But none of them were dressed in anything finer than layers of worn cotton, patched woolens, or army jackets. In fact, half of the room seemed to wear the uniform, and the loudness of the laughter also signaled to Mari that these weren't officers, but enlisted men, temporarily freed from the hovering of their superiors. Oh, uh, they can be a bit rough, Gazada said hesitantly as he closed the door again. Especially with a little ale in them, he muttered. What's ale? Perrin asked. Gazada waved that away. Oh, something I started brewing up last year. Nothing you'd like. But I'll have a word with Margot before I take you in there. She'll keep them proper. Well, edge proper, if you know what I mean. Mari winked. I teach teenage boys, Gazada, and the children are in full school. I think we can handle them. Gazada and Perrin shared a knowing look. Cute, isn't it? Perrin said to his former staff sergeant. How she thinks she knows enlisted men. Come to think of it, I'll threaten the men myself, Gazada patted Perrin on the shoulder. But first, we have a slight problem with this. He fingered a brass button and raised his dark eyebrows. You see, I have a dress code, and brass buttons belong in the front, not here in the back. Makes the men nervous, you know. Not that any brass has ever tried to come back here before, but I do have standards to maintain. The shins chuckled. Understood, Perrin said. The last thing I want to do is to cause you to lose any patrons. What do you want me to do with this ugly thing? Take it off, Gazada said easily. Eat without my jacket? Eat without messing it up, yes. I remember you, you losing control of my large sandwiches, sir. Spilling it all over that jacket. Tisk, tisk, what would your mother say? The shins laughed, and Perrin was already halfway to undressing. Don't worry, Gazada said. We have lots of army, army men remove the jacket here. You won't be the first or only white undershirt in the room. Gives men a sense of release. No jacket, no ranking. Hope that doesn't offend you. Not one bit, Perrin assured him. If only I had a white fur coat stitched with butterflies to lend you. Gazada slipped out the door and into the secret back room. A chorus of Sarge came through the door as his guests greeted their favorite ex-soldier. How many names does the man have? Pato wondered. I feel like we're doing something naughty, Jatesy giggled, sneaking into the back. Mari nodded. I know. What would your grandparents think? We'll be seen, but in the wrong half of the restaurant. From behind the closed door, they heard a deep woman's voice holler. All right now, Mr. Gazada has friends from the north here. Sharpen up you. Yes, you lot over there now. Women and children coming in. Oi, I said sharpen up. Women and children. No more of that mouth or I'll tell your wife the truth of why you were late last week. Gazada slipped back in, a little embarrassed. I guess Margot's got things in hand after all. Would you like to follow me, sir? Only if you call me Perrin. You're not my soldier anymore. Gazada winked. And only if you all call me Zada. I rather missed hearing that. Give me your jacket, Marie whispered to her husband. She rolled it up so that it was merely a blue bundle tucked under her arm, and she followed the rest of her family into the back room. The multiple conversations, far louder and more raucous than anything at the front end, paused to evaluate the newcomers, then resumed noisily as Gazada gestured to a woman large and beefy enough that she could have been Perrin's sister. Margot will take your order and see to it that everything remains fine. Now I have to attend to some business up front, but I'll be back later to check on you. And Pato. I'm expecting you to order a large sandwich, and I also expect you to finish it before your father. Pato beamed. You've got it, Zada. Gazada turned to leave, but stopped and smiled warmly at the family. So good to see all of you again. Margo, I'll be making their orders myself. And with that, he hustled out the door. Well, Margo said in a shockingly deep voice, 
What have we here? Mari was about to explain who they are when she realized the brutish woman wasn't looking at her, or even her children, but directly at her husband. Or rather, her husband's muscled and defined torso, which stretched the white undershirt to its limits. Mari made a mental note to see if any shops in Idemia made baggier undershirts. Some friends looking to eat, eh? Margot said as she eyed the colonel. Looks like you've done quite a bit of eating already, my dear man. Pato and Jaitsey chortled loudly behind their hands, while Mari slowly began to fume. It wasn't the enlisted men and their inappropriateness they needed to worry about. It was Margot. Perrin cleared his throat loudly, and the woman licked up into his eyes. She released a little whimper, and Mari wasn't sure if she was about to swoon or challenge him to an arm wrestle. Yes, thank you, Perrin said loudly and put his arm around Mari. My wife, children, and I would each like a gazada sandwich. Too small, too large, if that's not too much trouble. Margot's eyes traveled down to Mari, who put on a big smile and fluttered her eyelashes, hoping Margot would realize that Perrin preferred petite women whose meaty biceps didn't rival his. Margot's upper lip curled into a subtle snarl, and she snapped out of whatever daydream she'd fallen into. Too large and too small, coming up, find yourself a seat anywhere. She waved vaguely, and at the door that led to the kitchen, she hollered, Too large, too small, Gazada special. She turned back to the family. Means he makes it. Mead? Ale? Water, please, Perrin said amiably. Pools has the greatest water in the world, after all. To make ale with, Margot mumbled as she headed to one of the counters to retrieve their drinks. Mari gestured to a table with free space at the end. How about there, she suggested, and without any assistance from any men in black and white outfits, the family managed to sit down all by themselves. Perrin and Pato on one side of the well-worn wood table, Mari and Jaitsey across from them. Laughter from behind Perrin erupted so loudly that Pato wiggled his ears. Yow, that joke wasn't even funny. All I heard was, and then she said, that's not a melon? I don't get it. But Perrin was rubbing his forehead vigorously, and his ears were bright red. Mari was quite sure that, without even knowing what the first part of the story was, he did get it by the end. He leaned back, cleared his throat loudly, and said to the men behind him, Women and children, or do I need to get Margot over here to remind you? Sorry, friend, a man called over to him. Without turning around, Perrin raised his hand in a conciliatory manner. Thank you. To his family, he opened his mouth, looked at his daughter and son, then shut it again. Eventually, he said, just don't listen too closely. They'll forget again in about five minutes that we're here. And, well, while it sounds like they're talking about vegetables and fruit, they really aren't. Mari suppressed an uncomfortable smile and nodded. But Jaitsey said, so what are they really talking about then? Now it was Mari's turn to rub her head while her husband stared worriedly at his daughter. You've heard Riplak and Kandiri talking about sweet rolls, right? Perrin ventured cautiously. Jaitsey blinked in innocence and nodded. So did Pato. Perrin swallowed hard and looked at his wife. Mari smiled back. Go on, you're doing just fine. Then, because she so enjoyed his extreme discomfort, she added, So they're not really talking about sweet rolls either? Perrin sighed and turned back to his teenagers. When Riplack says sweet roll and does that thing with his eyebrows, he's actually... His children looked at him earnestly, sitting at the edge of their benches. Mari shook her head at her husband and snorted. You could offer some assistance here, he murmured at her. Sorry, she battered her eyelashes. I simply don't know that much about soldiers and such, remember? Perrin glared at her, then turned back at the questioning faces of his teenagers. Let's just say the men talk about food when they're hungry. Pato and Jaitsey looked at each other dubiously. Jaitsey turned back to Perrin. Uh-huh, 
I am nearly 15, Father. I know that they're talking about other things. But something in her expression suggested that she wasn't entirely sure what those other things were yet either. Pato merely shrugged. Yeah, but I don't find any of that interesting. Perrin rubbed his face with both hands, not daring to ask exactly what Pato thought that was. Her food should be here by now, shouldn't it? He looked at the door anxiously while Mari giggled. She'd have another little talk with Jatesy later, but Pato? He was all parents to deal with. Another door connected to the alley behind the building banged open and several men in blue jackets poured in. Mari hadn't noticed the door before, but it seemed to be the main access to the back restaurant. She wondered if Gazada could even fit through the narrow opening, which probably looked like nothing interesting from the outside and sure not to draw the attention of anyone in an officer's uniform. Margo, one of the men called, brought some brassies for some scrubbed up dinner. They'll be waiting for hours. The boys here and I are starving. We want it all tonight. Meat of the day first, love. As the six men filed happily in and good-naturedly shoved some acquaintances further down the table behind Perrin to make room for themselves, Pato leaned over to his father. Bunch of brassies? Are they talking about? Officers, Perrin said quietly to his family. Senior officers, to be specific. Brass buttons. That's why mine are hidden under the table by your mother. Jatesy leaned forward. They don't seem to be too happy about brassies. Perrin bobbed his head back and forth. They're not. Some of the officers treat the enlisted men more like servants than soldiers. These sergeants, they're sergeants, right? Mari glanced at their insignias and nodded. Three are sergeants, she whispered back. Two of them staff, another a master, then two corporals and a private. But it's the sergeants making the noise. That's because they've been in the army long enough to develop an opinion and to earn the right to express it, Perrin told them quietly. Then he smiled. My father would love this place. He always suspected the enlisted men gathered to gossip about the officers, but he never knew where or what they said. I almost feel like a spy. I bet Gazada hears all kinds of things back here. The kitchen door opened and in came a young woman with four enormous sandwiches, two twice as big as the others. Order four, her face screwed up in confusion. Be discreet. Perrin immediately stood up. That's for us, he said, taking the platter of food before she could announce the name. Her eyes grew big as she stared at the colonel, but a narrowing of his eyes told her that she needn't say anything else. She nodded before she hurried back to the kitchen. Mari exhaled as Perrin sat down. Whew, that was close. She nearly exposed our spy ring. What's wrong with people knowing our name? Jates, he asked as she nervously eyed the massive sandwich consisting of three kinds of breads, four kinds of meats, two kinds of cheeses, two kinds of sauces, and every vegetable that can be sliced thinly and stacked between everything else. And does this look bigger than it used to? First, the name Shin is associated primarily with one person, my father, Perrin said softly, so we really don't need that kind of attention. Second, oh yes, this is even bigger than I remember. Pato, if you can finish that, I'll buy you a horse with my pay increase. Very funny, father, Pato sneered. The last thing I want is a horse and you know it. But maybe he's added horse meat to this. Mari just shook her head at what sat in front of her, daring her to even find a way to bite it. I don't even know where to start. She smashed it experimentally, flattening it to be narrow enough to fit into her mouth. Ah, but I've missed Gazada. For the next ten minutes, the Shin family did nothing but chew and sigh in pure satisfaction, until the weight to the food in their bellies and the amount of what still remained on their plates caused Mari and Jatesy to admit defeat and take a rest. Perrin and Pato, however, watched each other's bites to time who could down their food the fastest. But Mari fretted privately that the winner of the contest would be the male who didn't heave it all up again later. The table of enlisted men behind Perrin had also gone quiet as they dove into some kind of meat concoction with gravy and curls of something on top. 
and only as they started sucking on the bones did they begin to talk loudly about brassies again. I'll tell you, the staff sergeant began to his audience of still chewing men, get the wrong kind of brassy in charge and nothing gets done unless the sergeants step up and take over. Hear, hear, another sergeant garbled with a mouthful. Two more men pounded the table in agreement. Take the brassy I brung here tonight. Colonel Snide just sits in his office giving commands, then walks around with his hands behind his back as if he owns the place, while the rest of us run around doing the training, the orders, the everything. I'm telling you, brassies wouldn't last a minute without all of us making them look good. Mari looked over at Perrin to gauge his response. He was licking his fingers as some sauce dribbled out of his sandwich, and Mari realized by the drippings on his white shirt that Gazada's recommendation for him to remove the jacket was most timely. Perrin caught her eye and winked at her. She raised her eyebrows toward the conversation behind him, and he merely shrugged in agreement. Snide, he mouthed and sneered. Not one of his favorite brassies either. Mari smiled. Still, he's better than my brassy, another sergeant spoke up. He downed a mug of mead, wiped his mouth on his sleeve, and belched loudly. Begging your pardon, ma'am, he nodded toward Mari, who nodded politely back. But my brassy, said the sergeant during another belch, he didn't seem to notice leaking out. He's that thorn, and I'm telling you, he's a mean one. Mari again watched Perrin, who just subtly nodded and took another big bite from which escaped a slice of something that landed smartly on his lap. Several of the men grumbled in agreement about Thorn this and Thorn that. Got a boy, too, soon to be graduating. Pity the commander who gets stuck with that brat. Hey, every commander deserves that brat. A few more men seconded the declaration, and Perrin chuckled quietly as he licked his fingers again. So he wasn't the only one not overly impressed with Lieutenant Thorne. At least Thorne promotes people, the first staff sergeant complained. I've been trying to get Snide's attention for years, but he doesn't see anything about past his own buttons. Mari wondered how Perrin would react to the accusation of a commander not promoting his men. To her surprise, Perrin picked up a cloth, wiped off his fingers, and sent a wink to Mari then leaned back to the table behind him. Without turning around, he addressed the sergeant. Got an idea for you, Perrin said. I worked with Snide some years back ago. He likes to hear about people suffering. The sergeant scowled at the back of Perrin's head. That sounds about right, but how do I make that work for me? Perrin turned part way to see the man. Have to get back to the colonel that the men are complaining about you. That maybe you're working them too hard or something? Private, Perrin gestured with his sandwich at a young man seated next to the staff, staff sergeant. You work under that man? The private nodded. Staff sergeant's the best, sir, he barked loyally. Good dog, Perrin said, but that's not what Snide needs to hear. You're acting as a footman tonight for his carriage, right? The private nodded eagerly. Privates weren't allowed to do anything more interesting than that, anyway. When you're helping Snide out of the carriage, let something slip about the sergeant's treatment of you tonight. Say that he, I don't know, made you scrub the mud off the wheels because you were disrespectful, or that he made you braid the horse's mane then had you take it all out again because he didn't like the effect. But you've got to say it in the right way. Perrin turned more fully to the table that sat in rapt attention to this unknown insider suggestion. Sound like you're whining, it'll hurt you. But say it in genuinely pained admiration, Snide will remember it. Tell him what to say, friend, another soldier encouraged. Perrin put on a thoughtful expression. Snide, sir, he said in a passable imitation of the young private that made him turn red and the other soldier snicker. Thank you for assigning me to this duty tonight. Staff Sergeant Perrin pointed to the man for his name. Oblong. Perrin blinked at that before continued. Staff Sergeant Oblong was most instructive tonight on the merits of keeping one's carriage wheels spotless and the finer points of horse's main presentation. Half of the men were already laughing, 
while the other half shushed them to hear the rest. So, while I so appreciate this opportunity, may I instead respectfully request some other kind of duty in the future, such as cleaning out the latrines? Perrin finished in an innocent smile, which made all of the men burst out laughing. That just might work, Oblong said. Snide would always assign the private to me as punishment. The private grinned, because even 18-year-olds know that spending the evening eating was an unbeatable assignment. And Snide will think I'm the most slagging son of a sow and give me a promotion. Perrin winced at the man's rough language, but Mari just looked down at the table and shook her head slightly. He didn't need to ruin the moment by reminding the men that women and children were present. Glad to be of help, Perrin said, and turned back to the second half of the sandwich. When did you work for Snide? The soldier asked him. Without turning around, Perrin waved a hand. About seven or eight years ago, when he was first installed as commander at Pools. Mari finished the rest of it in her head. And I trained him how to be a commander, but I promise I didn't teach him how to be a narrow-sighted old goat. Where are you serving now? Another man asked. Mari cleared her throat. I'm sorry, but I don't think you realize my husband's in the middle of a very important contest. You see, our son thinks he can finish his large gazada before his father, and unfortunately, he seems to be winning at the moment. The soldiers nodded and grinned. Gotta respect a man who brings his son here for a meal, Oblong said. Teach that boy what real eating is. Mari smiled sweetly at Oblong and kicked Jaitsi under the table, who was trying to control her giggling. The discussion at the other table turned back to their brassies. So, Snide and Thorn are here eating together? asked the private. Do so every moon or so, the master sergeant said. Suspect they are feeling each other out. Both are eyeing the mansion of the high general. He retires in two years, you know. Good thing he survived that tremor, eh? But soon, some younger man's got to take the spot. Cush is just too old. Mari noticed Perrin had stopped chewing his sandwich and had frozen in position. Nah, they might put Cush in for a time, but I think Thorn will get it in the end. Perrin's eyes shifted to Mari, and she noticed a level of alarm in them. Naturally, he didn't want the position, but maybe this was the first time it occurred to him that someone else, someone he thought less worthy, would take it instead. I don't know, mused another sergeant. While Thorn's the commander of the garrison, Snide's been commanding his own fort for longer. That might just edge him out as high general. Perrin's jaw clenched, and Mari mouthed to him, It has to be someone. There are others, another man offered. What about that younger Shin? Isn't he up somewhere in the north? At that, even Pato paused his non-stop gulping and listened to the talk behind him. Gazada even worked with that Shin, another man reminded them said he was the most decent officer he's ever known, said he did the dangerous work in the forest, wouldn't let anyone else do it. Perrin stared at his sandwich, but a corner of his mouth went up. Yeah, but he's been quiet for a while. Probably turned into one of those daft people who actually likes the mountains, another man said. Pato sneered and started to turn around to the table until Perrin elbowed him. He's only a lieutenant colonel anyway, pointed out another voice. No, no, he's not anymore, said one of Thorne's men. They just promoted him to colonel. Thorne wasn't too happy about that. I heard that too. I also heard that he finally left the mountains and came down to see his father when he'd heard he'd been buried. Oh, it's about time. Shin never comes to Idemia. How are you supposed to be a commander for the army if you never come back to the army's headquarters? Check in with your father? I bet he's gone a bit local. Mari squinted at her husband, looking for the meaning of that. Perrin just shook his head slightly. No, no, Gazada said he wasn't a stupid northerner at all. Now Mari pursed her lips and thought of a variety of ways to disprove the phrase a bit local. Best officer he knew, a soldier continued. Shin just liked the small village. But he's down here now, right? 
Yeah, yeah, and I think he even brought his wife and children, a son and a daughter, I think. Oh, slag. What is it? Oh, slag. It's like, shut up. Why? What? Just shut up. Shut up. None of the shins had moved a muscle in the last minute, too engrossed in the conversation behind them that now fell silent. Except for Pato, who whispered, Women and children, women and children, that Margot's not doing her job. I distinctly heard the S words. You mean, Perrin hissed at him, shut up. Mari dared to take her eyes off her husband and look instead at the soldiers behind him. Every last one of them was staring at the back of his head, and the color was draining out of their faces. Slaggin' son of a sow, murmured another man. All around them, conversations and laughter continued, except at the table full of enlisted men. Perrin set his sandwich down and caught his wife's gaze. He mouthed to her, don't move. Mari noticed some movement behind him and tried to subtly redirect his gaze, but he just studied her as if working out what to do next. Uh, father, Jatesy started, and Perrin shifted his gaze to her. He widened his eyes in warning. But, father, Jates, he snarled, just don't say. He noticed that she was no longer looking at him, but at something above him. Slowly, his eyes traveled up to see five men standing at the end of the table, each at stiff attention with his arm in salute. Perrin puffed out his cheeks and released his breath. He craned his neck to look behind him and saw another dozen men in anxious formation. Colonel Shin, announced Staff Sergeant Oblong, what an honor it is to have you in our presence. And sorry for the reference about the slagging son of a sow, another soldier behind him muttered urgently. Not intended at you at all, sir. Oh, for crying out loud, Perrin mumbled. He reluctantly got to his feet, his hands in the air as a kind of surrender. I'm not about to salute you back, you know, because I was told that when the jacket came off, so did the ranking. My jacket's currently balled up, and I'm here as a hungry man looking for a meal better than what those ridiculous brassies are waiting for out there. So if you'd all just take your seats again, I'd really appreciate it. And now I'm behind in this eating contest with my son, so unless you all stop this saluting nonsense, I may get a bit annoyed. Turn on the charm, Mari tried to send him the message. Use that smile, the good one, not the scary one. Come on, you remember how? Ah, very good, almost convincing. Each of the enlisted men slowly put their hands down, watching the other to make sure they did it at roughly the same time. And yes, Perrin said, trying for a broader grin, I am completely daft, stupid, whatever, because I love the mountains and hate everything about Idemia, except for this sandwich, which I have to admit is starting to get the better of me. He pounded his chest with his fist as if to dislodge something. Exactly where do you put it all? The soldiers grinned and visibly relaxed, some even sitting back down. Please, sir, Sergeant Oblong said, a, still a bit shaky. We didn't mean any disrespect. We just spoke the truth, Perrin said, patting him on the shoulder. I didn't hear a word that I didn't agree with. And if you can't speak freely here, where can you speak? I'm only sorry I made any of you uncomfortable. That wasn't my intention. My intention was to eat a great meal. And incidentally, my best friend is also my master sergeant. Oblong smiled. Gazada was right about you. And I'm right about Snide, Perrin said to deflect the compliment. You and the private should practice what he'll say, so that you'll both give the same story. Sir, I hope this isn't too forward, but can I buy you a mug of ale? Perrin frowned. I'm not sure that's entirely appropriate, but here's an idea. How about I buy everyone at your table a round? provided you answer me one simple question. Oblong was already grinning, and several of his friends were nudging each other about the round of ale coming from a brassy. We'd be honored, sir. What's the question? What is ale? Oblong grinned and went for the biggest show of bravery he could. This brassy 
is stupid. Never heard of ale? I think we need to give him a bit of an enlisted man education. A while later, Gazada returned to the back room and stared at the scene before him. Mari and the children, occasionally chortling, remained at the table where they were afforded an excellent view of Perrin, sitting near the fire pit surrounded by enlisted men singing. Well, Perrin wasn't singing. Mari chuckled to herself. That wasn't his style. But he was swaying with the men on either side of him because their momentum didn't offer him any other alternative. In his hand was a large mug, the contents of which he kept evaluating with each experimental sip. Jaitsi and Pato laughed every time he scowled at the drink. Gazada hurried over to them. What in the world's going on here? Pato sniffed. The enlisted men are teaching the Brassy a thing or two. How did they find out he's a Brat? I mean, how did they find out he's an officer? Don't worry, Zada, Mari patted his arm. It just kind of happened. No harm done. We'll see about that, said Gazada with some concern. What's he drinking? Your latest creation, Mari said. Ale? Gazada grimaced. He handed a sheet of parchment to Mari and said, That's for your mother. I'll be right back. As the large man tried to wriggle his way through the press of enlisted men to reach the lone brassy on the other side of the fire pit, Mari perused the page in her hands. That's the menu, Jaitsi said, sufficiently astonished. Look at those prices. Is that really a quarter slip of gold? That's ten full slips of silver, Pato whispered in awe. For escargo and garlic gazada, what is that? I have no idea, Mari said, but won't your grandmother Pato love to figure that out? Over at the fire pit, Gazada was pulling Perrin out of the crush of men who protested that Sarge was taking away their new buddy. Up, up, this brassy's got a reputation to maintain, boys, and several of you are driving home colonels in about an hour, Gazada reminded them. How many rounds have you had? He glared at Margot, who shrugged lazily. Maybe two. Shin was buying. And she held up the full gold slip, which Mari knew could have paid for everyone's meal that night to the back restaurant. Said I could keep what's left. No more, Gazada said firmly to the woman, who merely went back to spitting in a mug and wiping it clean. Mari bit her lip as her husband walked back, a little wobbly. He stared into his mug. Zada, I think something's wrong with this. It just doesn't taste like barley. Perrin sat at the table and plopped the mug in front of Pato, who sniffed it. As if you were trying to make bread, messed up the amount of ingredients, forgot about it for a while. Gazada shrugged. Well, yes, not too far off there, actually. Gets a bit busy when we're experimenting. Until it developed the smell, and still you decided to swallow it down? Gazada bobbed his head back and forth. Eh, you'd be amazed by what I've decided to swallow down. It's how I know what's edible and what needs more tweaking. And you think this doesn't need more tweaking? The enlisted men seem to enjoy it, Gazada chuckled at Perrin's furrowed eyebrows. Pato peered into the mug and scowled. Looks and smells more like something you should leak out rather than drink in. He gestured to his father's drooling mouth, which he was wiping awkwardly with his arm. It's rather an acquired taste, Gazada admitted, sliding the mug out of Pato's reach. Zada, what exactly is ale? Mari asked. He looked into the mug. How much did he have? That was his only one. Gazada's shoulders relaxed. Only half gone. Good. Ale's a bit like mead. Mead! Perrin exclaimed. I don't drink mead. But stronger. I know, sir, you don't drink. That's why I've rescued you. And also, why such a small amount has had a rather pronounced effect on you? Gazada noted, as if evaluating a questionable dish and second-guessing the addition of the pig snout. Oh dear, Mari stifled a giggle. For how long will it affect him? 
He'll be fine by morning. Bit of a headache, perhaps, but I'm so sorry. I had no idea things would... He gestured to the fire pit, where Oblong was now singing a weepy solo comparing his long-lost girlfriend to a variety of produce items. Maybe I let this batch brew just a tad too long. Oblong! he shouted. Women and children! Pato turned to his sister. All right, I give up. What do turnips have to do with women? She shrugged back. I'm still trying to figure out how an ear of corn is like his love. So, Mari said loudly over the crooning of Oblong and held up the menu. For my mother? Gazada beamed while Perrin placed his forehead carefully on the table and moaned quietly about too much cheese. She is well, right? Gazada asked as he sat next to Mari. Fine, fine, not even much damage to her house. Gazada nodded in relief. Always the lovely lady. Well, she and I had many discussions about food at the inn, and one day we speculated that if you made just the right kind of sauce and came up with an elaborate enough name, you could convince people to eat just about anything. Like garlic escargot, Jaitsey asked. Miss Jaitsey, at this moment I have two very fine Colonel Brassies dining on that right now, as well as three administrators, and it's nothing more than garlic and leek sauce covering snails. The shins burst out laughing, except for Perrin, who patted the back of his own head comfortingly as he drooled on the, the table. Tell Mrs. Pato we were right, Gazada grinned. I want her to have the evidence. This here, he pointed out another item in flowing handwriting. Nothing more than goose livers. And this, fried frogs and onions. Right here, squirrels. And this item, simple river crawdads. Those ugly things like big water roaches, Jaitsey exclaimed. People eat them? The elite of Idemia, Gazada clarified, who don't know these litter the rivers and can be scooped up by ten-year-olds and brought to me by the bucket full for a generous two full slips of silver, then boiled and sauced and plated in ten minutes. The elite think they're enjoying a delicacy no one else in the world can afford. So they happily pay five times more for one lobster bisque then I pay for a whole bucket of them. So that's how you do all of this, Perrin mumbled into the table. Feed all of these people giant sandwiches that, oh, fill an entire family for just half a slip of silver because the brassies up front pay a full week's wages for, oh, excuse me, for snails that you likely picked up out of your own garden. And what in the world have you put in this ale? His family chuckled as Gazada nodded. He's coming out of it already. The bigger the man, the quicker he revives. By the time you leave, no one will be the wiser that he was gulping. Sipping, Mari reminded. Gazada nodded. Sipping an enlisted man's drink. But yes, that's a bit of what I do. I see myself as bringing some balance to the world. The world may not be fair, but my little corner of it is. Everyone at my restaurant eats well, according to what they think well means. Perrin pulled up his head from the table and wiped his chin. Zada, he said as he propped his head on his hand, don't take this the wrong way, but I don't remember you being so insightful. How did you get so clever? By sitting here, listening to the people, the real people of Pools and Itamia, not those snobby folks with servants, uh, forgive me, but like my grandparents, Jaitsey said matter-of-factly. Don't worry, we know what you mean. She spoke for her family. Gazada smiled appreciatively and patted her hand. I come back here a few times each day and just listen. You can learn a lot about people and how they see the world, especially when you remember you don't know more than they do. Perrin gave him a half smile. Good advice. I always thought so. 
I learned that from you, sir, back in Edge, the former staff sergeant said respectfully. You always listened to me, to all of us, no matter our rank or how long we'd served. May not have agreed with us, but you listened. Perrin looked down at the table, a bit embarrassed. And had you warned me about ale, I would have listened too, he grumbled. I appreciate that you do all of this, Zada, he gestured hazily to the room, even if you don't have to. Again, something I learned from you. These are things we may not want to do, but must do. That's what you told me, remember? Perrin rubbed his eyes. Zada, right now I'm struggling to remember my age. What are you talking about? The day you handed me a stack of silver slips and told me to find you white clothing so you could sneak around in a snowy forest looking for twelve garters that turned out to be fourteen, Gazada said quietly. Perrin nodded slowly and massaged his forehead. And I said to you, are you sure this is the best idea? I can't imagine why you want to do this. And then you said, I'm not doing it because I want to, but because it needs to be done. Someone has to do it. Might as well be me. I wish I remembered that conversation, Perrin mumbled. You don't have to, sir. I remembered it for both of us, Gazada told him. It took a few years to sink into my fat brain, but I've realized that I don't need a commander or an administrator to tell me what I should do. I can choose to do things on my own. I used to be a 10-year-old trying to find a way to help my mother pay her taxes. Wasn't her fault her husband died or that my grandparents couldn't help us. She did the best she could, but the king didn't think that was enough. I wish then I had some man giving me full slips of silver for playing with crawdads in the river for an hour, and now I can and I do. Perrin held up an unsteady finger to make a point, but he was instead distracted by its wobbling around. Remarkable, Gazada whispered to Murray. He holds his ale worse than a toddler. You've given ale to a toddler? No, well, not intentionally. Little boy's mother was in here selling baskets, you know, and the child discovered a neglected mug. Hush, Pato shushed them in mock soberness. It's trying to speak. The point, Perrin stared at his pointing finger. He gave it a worthy snap and gave up. The point is, Gazada, you've done good things here. And now I'm going to take a little nap. An hour later, the Shin family readied to head back to Idemia. As a more stable and alert parent buttoned up his jacket, several of the enlisted men stood to salute him. The colonel just rolled his eyes at them. When the Shin's driver came in, he feigned shock, passably well, that such a place existed, even though the large gazada he had ordered earlier was waiting for him. A waiter came down from the kitchen with word that the colonels up front were also finishing and would be ready to leave in ten minutes. Gazada embraced the Shins goodbye and showed them the best way to sneak through the alley into the livery stables without being noticed by anyone of importance. That man is the silverest brassy I ever met, Oblong declared as the door shut behind the Shin family. Hear, hear, many soldiers called out in agreement. Oblong nudged Gazada. Sarge, he'd be a great high general, wouldn't he? Gazada smiled. Not only would he be, but will be. It's not something he wants to do, but it's something he realizes he should do. Don't worry about Snide or Thorn in the mansion, Gazada said to the closed door. In about two years, I'll be delivering a few large Gazadas to the mansion at least once a week, compliments of the owner. World's going to be a better place, men. Now, that was an experience, Maury chuckled as the coach lurched forward. Perrin dropped his cap on the seat next to him, grabbed his head, and moaned. His children giggled. I thought you were feeling better, Maury said as she massaged his neck. No, 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 that stuff's worse than mead. 
I drank meat a couple times back in command school, and the same thing always happened. Sicker than an expecting woman. Mari frantically wrenched open the window on his side of the coach, while his children burst out laughing. Too loud, he murmured pitifully. Please don't. Yes, please don't, Mari said to him. And if you have to, aim it out the window. Don't anybody tell my parents what happened when we get back, he mumbled. They're probably already asleep, but I don't want them knowing. Jatesy turned to her brother. Did you have any idea we had such a rebellious father? He's been drinking, and now he wants us to sneak him in past his parents? Mari snorted as their children laughed. I'm sorry, Perrin, but really, it's rather funny. Another reason why I hate Idomia, he grumped as he flopped on the bench. His family's continued laughter didn't help. After a few minutes, Jatesy said slowly, Father, hmm, he mumbled from his prone position, where Mari was now massaging his head. Are Colonel Snide and Colonel Thorn rich? Pato sat up a bit at that. Huh, suppose so. They can pay that much to eat things I crunch under my boots. Pato and Jatesy exchanged glances in the dark coach, and Mari knew what the next question would be. So is Colonel Shin now rich, too? Of course we are, Mari declared. We've been rich for many years, with a comfortable home, good friends and family, and each other. Isn't that cute, Pato? Jatesy said in the same tone her father had used earlier. How she thinks we're still only five and four years old. What does it matter how much he earns, Mari said. We have all we need. Perrin waved aimlessly. What your mother said. So we are rich, Pato nodded in approval. Now we'll have to take a coach everywhere in Edge. No, 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 Perrin droned slowly and forced himself into a semi-sitting position. Pay is based on years of service, ranking, and size of fort. The garrison and the fort at Pools are both much larger than Edge, which is the second smallest fort. So, Jades, Pato explained, father's the second least rich colonel in the world. Ah, but Moreland doesn't have a colonel, Jates here reminded him, so he is the least rich colonel in the world. Ah, well done, Colonel Shin, Pato said smug smugly, and he and his sister chuckled. But Perrin wasn't amused. And since Moreland is dying as a village, there's not even a major there anymore, he reminded them sternly. His children quieted and looked down. Mari wasn't unsympathetic. It was easy to forget that others were losing their homes while they were living in a mansion. She'd been guilty of forgetting about home herself. To try to swing the conversation around again, she said, Oh, your father's not getting that much of a pay increase. Uh, Perrin said slowly. Need the window? No, is that the pay increase? Mari frowned at him. We already discussed it. And, she added more quietly, what she'll be doing with it. Yes, but it's a little larger than you may think. And it also comes with a bonus. How much? Perrin shifted uncomfortably. Enough to buy a new house. Apparently brass buttons need bigger houses. As if when what you live in reflects who you really are, Mari scoffed. I'm not in the mood to argue with you or to agree with you, wife. Perrin moaned. He took up her hand and put it on his temple again so she'd massage it. Just agree with me then, she kissed his cheek. Usually do, he closed his eyes. Jatesy and Pato exchanged anxious looks. Do we have to? Jatesy said. Move, I mean. I know our house is rather small, but it's the only home I've ever known. I don't want to move either, Pato announced. Mari smiled at them. Nor do we, right? Perrin grunted. No one in Edge expects us to move, and the gold's already going in another direction, he added cryptically. What does that mean? Pato wondered. 
It means your father and I already discussed that it could go to someone who could use it more than us, Mari explained, although I wasn't aware of that bonus. Been working out how to deal with it, he mumbled. Think I have it figured out. Where's it going? Jatesy asked. Where all my future pay is going, to people who need it more. It's not as if my duties are changing or my hours increasing, but your mother and I know of someone who knows of someone. He paused to work out if that was the correct thing to say. So we're just going to slip it over there. To Mari's pleasure, Jatesy grinned. I like that. Someone's going to have a welcome surprise and we don't have to move. Like that man in the rubbish pile at the garrison, Pato said. Perrin opened his eyes. What, son? The gold. Is it going to that man we saw trying to get a blanket out of the rubbish pile? A quality in the tone of Pato's voice suggested he already knew the answer was no. I have looked for him, Perrin said quietly, but I haven't seen him again. I'll keep trying, though, each time I have to go to the garrison. There are a few things I'd like to give him, but no, the pay increase isn't going to him. But it's a nice idea. Pato nodded slowly. I'll just imagine that someone did that for him already. That's why you can't find him again. Mari blinked back tears. The boy could be so obnoxious, then abruptly so compassionate. It was as if it was his secret, and he accidentally revealed his softer nature. Someone will take care of him, I'm sure, Jatesy said with hollow confidence, and she patted her brother comfortingly on the leg. Mari sniffled. It was times like this she thought she could envision her children as adults, and the kind of people they could become astonished her. Listen, Jatesy, mother sniffling. It sounds like she's about to sing a song about her long-lost love, Pato said earnestly. And just like that, they were snickering teenagers again. Let's talk about something different, such as... Mari faltered because there was only one other thing that overwhelmed her mind lately. And since she couldn't come up with anything else, she finally said, What your grandparents expect of us in a few days at the dinner. Perrin lunged for the window and lost half a large gazada on the road to Itamia. It was about 10 minutes after that, after the coachman assured Colonel Shin that they could get the outside of the coach all cleaned again, no problem, sir, The Jatesy said, why does the garrison have so many men? It's not like Ida Mia ever gets attacked. And they'll claim that's why, Perrin said, lying back down again and resting his head on Mari's lap. At least he was finally sounding more alert. So many soldiers keep the place safe. But it's the villages on the edges of the world that need protection, isn't it? Jatesy insisted. And that, my daughter, Perrin said, is why you'd never make a good officer or administrator. You're thinking logically, not politically. The only thing logic and politics share are a few letters. Ida me is so messed up, he mumbled, as he repositioned Mari's hand to rub his forehead. A city where a 15-year-old girl is more reasonable than dozens of adult men. Hey, she's right, Pato said, startled. And not to be outdone by his sister, who smiled smugly, he added, It's all of the northern villages that get hit the most than the ones in the west. Doesn't trades have a sizable fort, Mari asked, in the southwest? Perrin grunted. Largest outside of the garrison, 1,500 men, he said to the gasps of his family. And you know why? The gold and silver mine. 500 soldiers are on duty round the clock, guarding the roads in and out, stationed around the perimeter and inspecting every worker. The mine is where the wealth is, so that's where the soldiers are. Anytime there's even a hint of a presence in the forest 20 miles away, The garrison sends down another one or two thousand men just to keep the mine protected. How often have they been raided? Mari asked. Since the beginning, when garters made their presence known again, I think only two or three times. And only once was successful, back when Jatesy was still a baby. 
Wait a minute, Jatesy exclaimed loudly, and Perrin flinched and rubbed his temples until Mari's fingers could get there over for him. We've been hit dozens of times by thieves and Moreland. Didn't you just say they lost a small herd of cows not long ago? We should have the majority of soldiers in the north. Perrin sighed. Moreland got hit several times a year, he intoned sadly. Their major requested more soldiers. My father tried to convince the command board they were needed, and always the three administrators shot it down. Cush is also on that board, but he quit trying to even bring it up. But why? Now Pato was angry. Politics, Pato. Moreland is small, far away, and no one important has ever come from there. That's why no one in Idemia cares it's been wiped out by the land trimmer. They're not rich, so their taxes were minimal. They're strange people who actually like the mountains, are happy with simply raising cattle and crops, and don't even have an arena. They don't benefit the administrators at all, and they see no reason to send protection or assistance. But that's... Jatesy spluttered. Mari nodded sadly. Politics. The administrators care only about two kinds of people, those who bring them wealth and power and those who threaten to take it away. Moreland does neither. Same with Edge. Your mother's right, Perrin told his children. Trades is the source of all wealth. Moreland provides nothing but some wheat and corn, which is far more valuable in an emergency than shiny metals anyway. The administrator of taxation stores the grain until the next harvest, at which point they simply throw it away to make room for the new. What? Pato exclaimed. They could give that away instead of throwing it away, like to those homeless people by the river. There's a lot Idemia could do better, son, Perrin grumbled. I hate Idemia, Jatesy murmured. Perrin grinned and Mari patted his cheek. Why didn't Moreland complain, Pato wondered. Look at everything here and compare it to what they have there and... Ah, but that's the thing, Pato, Perrin pointed out, struggling to sit up again. How many people do you know, besides soldiers, who ever travel to another village? His children pondered that for a moment. Mr. Heggett came from somewhere else, Jatesy offered. And sometimes students leave to go to a university, but after that? And why don't people travel? Perrin pressed. Because they think it's too hard, too far, said Pato in disappointment. Something bad will happen, and then when you get to someplace else, like Coast, everything is different than what you know. It's a terrifying hassle, Jatesy summed up. Exactly, Perrin told them. So no one travels anywhere. And if they do, it's because of an emergency or they think they're dying and should see something first. The travel is usually tied to something unpleasant, so the whole trip becomes unpleasant. Then people complain, Mari said, and talk about how strange and hard it all was. And so naturally no one ever wants to go or do anything. It's easier to stay at home. And you have to admit, our trip down here was anything but fun and relaxing. Everyone grunted in agreement to that. But I'd still do it over again, Pato said in a small voice. Me too, Jatesy chimed in. It was hard, but I'm kind of proud of us. Actually, she wrinkled her nose and thought, it wasn't all that bad. You can get used to it, like grandmother and grandfather have, why, look at us now, going to pools just for a dinner and driving all the way back again. It's almost as far as to Mount Seen, but people rarely make that drive unless they have to. Pato sat up taller. So, people don't travel because they're convinced it's just too hard? That's dumb. Perrin chuckled sadly. No, that's just human nature. We believe the wrong things and can't think of alternatives. Like those in Moreland, I doubt any of them ever came to Idemia. In their minds, the city is the same as their little village, just spread out more. Even their major had lingering fears from his time in command school, so he likely never talked to anyone about the city. 
People from Moreland never imagined anything as grand as you've seen here, so they don't think they could demand anything more of it. If they knew just how much Idemia possessed, I'm sure they'd insist on more soldiers and better defenses. As it is, they just grew used to their condition and saw no sense in fighting the inevitable. Grew used to their condition, Mari murmured. No sense in fighting. That's exactly what happened with the servants of the kings. That's why they sat there for so long behind the rock wall, never insisting on anything better, never imagining anything more. Until High General Per Shin put an end to the injustice by heaving himself over. Perrin, she said quietly, we still have a ways before we get to the mansion. I think now would be a good time to tell the children about a certain group of servants and a particular ancestor of theirs who did something for them. Perrin smiled in the dark. I think you're right. Are you better now? Mari asked Perrin as he crawled into bed with her. He'd spent the last half hour in the washing room next door, and she'd been wincing for him the entire time. Yes, finally, I think. Still, I'm going to stay over on this side for the night, if you don't mind. See why I didn't bring you any mead that first night I came over to talk to you? I have a feeling you wouldn't have agreed to marry me if I were throwing up in your washing room. Yet another thing I never knew about you. Mead makes you sick. And yet another reason why you hate Idemia. It's giving away all of your secrets. He just groaned. She chuckled. <laughs> so, you said you had a plan for the house bonus? Going to give some of it to Brillen. By the way, when I was over at the garrison earlier, I was going through some paperwork and realized that way back when Brillen was first assigned to Edge, they figured his pay rate wrong. For the past 16 years, he's been underpaid. Of course, when I pointed that out, they were most embarrassed and knew they should immediately rectify the situation. I told them I could carry that large amount of pay back with me and bring their apologies personally as well. What a perfect coincidence, Mari exclaimed. You can add your pay to what they're sending, plus your bonus... Her husband's chuckling stopped her. What? I was hoping that all sounded believable. I guess I practiced it well enough. Wait, you just made all that up? Even with my ailing mind, I'll even tell him he shouldn't mention it to them because some of the higher-ups don't know about the error and the lower downs would get in even more trouble. Best just to accept the situation and also realize they'll be sending a little extra each moon into his pay to make up for the inconvenience. Mari nodded into the dark. Clever man. After another pause, she said, They took it so well tonight, didn't they? Perrin didn't even have to ask what she was talking about. They did, his voice swelled with pride. I spotted both of them in the study, staring at the portrait of their great-grandfather. I always thought he was painted a bit sterner than he really was, but in the candlelight, he looks gentler, more like the man I knew. I think they saw that part of him tonight. He was a great high general. Just like your father, Mari whispered. Yes, Perrin's voice sounded like he was smiling. He's thwarted at every turn, but at least he keeps trying to do the right thing. Just like you. You, too, would make a great high general. Mari, I thought you wanted me to feel better. And that's the end of that long chapter. Thank you.